Today's lecture will be concentrated on three practical topics. So I will start from the kitchen and I will tell you all about the kitchen design. Uh, here in that lecture, I will be talking about very large uh, production kitchens, but I will also stress in the places where we can design the small kitchens. Then I will talk about the public toilets, which are outside, so not connected to the buildings, what was Agnieszka telling you about, but, connect that, but the toilets that you build totally outside. And then uh, I will add something about shaping the auditorium, some general guidelines, uh, because the shaping the auditorium is a very important element and we haven't discussed that yet. And as I noticed in your work, some of you haven't decided yet on the slope, so that would be a great time to talk about these issues. Uh, kitchen, uh, kitchens are the elements that are very important because the clean parts and the dirty parts, these zones have to be distanced from each other. They cannot connect just in a simple way. Also, uh, the kitchen consists of storage and employee zones. Of course, we have also a large gastronomic room, but the large gastronomic room is something apart from the kitchen. Kitchen is where you produce food and then it goes outside to the kitchen area or outside to the external cafe and such. Uh, we can distinguish two uh, main uh, kitchens and one of them is the kitchen that is independent and you produce it from the scratch. Everything is produced from um, raw material until it's being cooked and ready to go to the uh, cafe restaurant. And we talk about the subsidiary kitchens, so the kitchens where you have pre-prepared products that are coming to the kitchen, that are brought there from central kitchens which are settled somewhere else and uh, these kind of kitchens are the kitchens that probably you will have in your projects uh, because these are much smaller kitchens they don't require so many produ production elements here we see the production part of the uh, the uh, storage part of the kitchen and service part of the kitchen this is the production part of the kitchen they connect together here at the top line of that uh, graph that you see. So uh, first, simple delivery entrance that is for products. People don't sh should not go through that entrance. The employee entrance should be separate. Of course, it's in the perfect situation where we have huge kitchen and we can design whatever we need. Uh, in most of the kitchens, you will see that this is the same entrance. And of course, it's not a perfect solution, but at occasions it's allowed. In the main, connecting these two entrances together, we have a control point and registration. So we have to know who's coming to the kitchen, at what time, is that person healthy? And uh, for the delivery, we have to have registered every type of product because we cannot have a situation that something gone bad, something was spoiled, something was infected, like with, for example, with salmonella bacteria, and we don't know where it came from. We have to know what producer uh, pr uh, producer brought that product, what was the date, and uh, so we can trace back uh, the way of infection and that kind of production can be shut down. So that's very important. Everything that comes in is registered. We have garbage room here. As you can see, it's not connected towards the kitchen. It's always a separate room with distance from the kitchen, with a separate ventilation. There couldn't, cannot be any risk that any bacteria, insects, um, bed smells will go back from the garbage room towards the general communication or towards other rooms. That's impossible, so there cannot be any connection. Uh, this room is totally, uh, totally distanced and it has uh, doors uh, to the outside, separate ventilation, that has separate outlet. Uh, so uh, if you want to take garbage from the kitchen, you have to go outside, go to the garbage room, throw the garbage out, come back, wash your hands, change your clothes if needed, and then you can go back to the kitchen. Uh, that's usually done at the end of the day, so it's not such a huge problem. Um, if there's a heat, if there are like 40 degrees of centigrade outside, uh, if there are some infections like we have now, the garbage have to be separate, waiting for a garbage company to come. Okay, 
so we have the general communication which connects everything together and uh, you can see that if it's an independent building of a restaurant and it doesn't have uh, central the building can have of course the central boiler the fuel storage but if it doesn't have it's like a separate restaurant then it has to be here of course with a technical room for uh, electricity appliances and connections and for the employees we have cloakroom we have toilets and sanitary room and this kind of room cannot be accessible towards the general public never ever uh, people who work with the food have special uh, special examinations. They have to have uh, separate certificates that they are healthy. They are not carrying any diseases. So uh, we cannot allow anybody from outside to use these toilets. And a social room for them to rest and eat their breakfast or their lunch. Uh, they cannot eat in the kitchen area. That's totally not allowed. There has to be a separate room for that and some additional technical areas for any, uh, any uh, additional uh, appliances. Then we have the room for cleaning solutions. So here we have all the uh, chemical substances, cleaning solvents that we are using for cleaning everything. And there has to be a storage of that because in the kitchen area, in the storage area, you need, you need a lot of cleaning. It has to be cleaned every day on every day, uh, daily basis. So there has to be enough of these uh, supplies here. Then we have the dry, dry product storage, storage here. So we start with the products. Each product is, uh, uh, is um, um, stored separately. Uh, this is how uh, our uh, health ministry is uh, allowing us to store products. So there cannot be any mixture between the products. And you have three types of storages, the dry storages, which are cool and clean, the cold storages, which are like a um, a refrigerators, and uh, freezing storages, where you have freezers for uh, keeping products deeply frozen. So in dry product storage, we store tea, uh, we store coffee, flour, rice, um, pasta, all these products that are closed and are dry. Then we have a poultry, poultry cooler, meat cooler and sausage cooler. These things have to be separate. It's not just meat. Poultry, fish, these are separate types of meat. So they have to be stored separately. Of course, if you don't have such a lot of place to store everything in separate rooms, you can have separate freezers or refrigerators for that product. So separate for poultry, separate for sausage, separate for fish. Uh, separate for the eggs. Eggs may carry salmonella bacteria, so they have to be uh, stored separately. And before they are being used in the kitchen, they are radiated in order to kill the bacteria. So the eggs that are going to the kitchen will not have any bacteria on them and inside of them. This is a, some so special uh, radiation uh, utilities that allow us to prepare eggs in this way for the professional kitchens. Drink storage can be connected to the kitchen. Drink storage can also be um, by the bar. It doesn't have to be in that place. It can be near the dining room and it can be for uh, storing uh, all the juices in bottles, water, uh, still sprinkling, uh, other types of drinks, of course alcohol if it's being used in that type of restaurant and it's a huge amount of uh, bottles. Just imagine that you are serving dinner every day for 200 people. Imagine how many small bottles of water you need for this amount of people. It's not like one person drinks only one water. Uh, then we have uh, spare porcelain storage. So every additional porcelain uh, pots, um, cups and stuff are stored here. The vegetables are separate and sometimes in some kitchens you have separate cooler for uh, vegetables which are being brought with uh, mud. So uh, carrots, uh, so um, uh, potatoes. Uh, you don't have here 
and and the other vegetable storage is for clean vegetables like cauliflowers and uh, avocados uh, so you have vegetable cooler and uh, you have freezers again in the freezers you freeze separately uh, the uh, fish uh, meat poultry okay this is how we do it so as you can see it's a huge uh, it's a huge uh, area usually this area can have 100 200 square meters just for this area that you see here and here you have a kitchen cooler so it's directly connected to the kitchen so when you pre-prepare if you have such a huge meals like i've mentioned 200 dinners at one hour um, then you have to have pre-prepared salads it's impossible to get all these salads uh, prepared during preparing the meat so uh, you have kitchen cooler where you uh, store clean already prepared uh, products like uh, salads like uh, desserts and here you have additional kitchen storage this is the so-called daily storage so you take many as many um, tea or uh, flour or uh, rice uh, that you need per one day uh, you take as many drinks oils and stuff and you store them here they are being just so you just don't have to go while doing the meal through all that storage you pre-prepare -pre -pre the things that you need in the kitchen because you have very little time to do all the food. And so let's go to the kitchen area. So the same rule applies in the kitchen area. There has to be a separation of different products between each other during the preparation as well. So you have egg preparation, you have fish preparation and you have vegetable preparation. So you have to uh, wash and radiate the eggs you have to you can you can uh, also clean fish you have a lot of uh, garbage from fish and you prepare the vegetables mm, so you usually peel them off and clean them from dirt from anything they carry so all these uh, garbage are going directly from the dirty corridor to the outside uh, to the mm, uh, to the garbage room that we've seen uh, in the previous slide and as you can see they can be lit with a natural light because uh, in that part uh, people are working for a longer period of time and what do they need they need a washing basin they need a sink here uh, they need a working space and they need a little bit of space to store uh, the, the, pre, the products that will be prepared here. And while they are being prepared, they are linked together with the, with the window to the kitchen. So they give the clean products, uh, already washed products, already peeled products to the kitchen. And uh, here they are being picked up and prepared. So you have preparation of salads, preparation of uh, desserts, preparation of uh, pastry, uh, preparation of uh, other flour made products like uh, pierogies or pasta. Uh, you have separate preparation of meat, separate preparation of poultry, separate preparation for fish and so on. So these places of preparation are placed around the kitchen and of course, everything is lit with a natural light because the kitchen is the working space. Uh, of course, very direct uh, southern or uh, daily light, it's not perfect in the kitchen. So the best way is when the light is uh, diffused. Sometimes uh, you use the skylights, but the skylights with diffusion, so not direct sunlight. Or you use windows that have uh, proper sun blinds that can regulate the amount of the light inside of the kitchen area in uh, and in the middle you have a core of the kitchen it's baking cooking frying so it's warm preparation for the kitchen while everything is prepared you have a huge distribution counter everything is placed on the plates and it can go outside it's picked up by the kale uh, by the uh, waiters in the uh, waiter distribution area 
they pick up the um, the um, dishes and they can go outside. Uh, in this area also, what is also very important, we have dishwashing and uh, all the dirty uh, plates and other, um, other uh, porcelain is being taken, porcelain glass uh, is being taken by the waiters and before it comes to the clean zones, it has to be washed and it has to be steamed with a hot steam, so it has to be disinfected. It's highly important. So only after the dishes are being cleaned, they are given through the uh, distribution shelves towards the kitchen. Sometimes these are charts, sometimes these are shelves. It doesn't matter what is important, no dirty cup will come back through the clean area. There cannot be any connection. And waiter, before taking clean things again, has to wash hands before taking care of clean things after, uh, after distributing the dirty, um, um, the dirty uh, cluttery and uh, plates towards the dishwashing area. So please remember about that. Let's see how these, um, these stations, these elements uh, look like. So first, so let's see uh, the uh, preparation area. So here you can either prepare eggs, fishes, or you can cook here also. This is the same uh, type of preparation that you use for preparing meat, uh, doing the um, uh, other um, food that you will be preparing. So you have a working plane, you have a sink, everything is made from stainless steel, so it's very easy to clean. It's resistant to a heavy cleaning. You have additional, uh, additional uh, cupboards for uh, equipment that you need on this type of working place. And you have a space for storing the products that you will be preparing. After the products are prepared, you give them to the cooking core. And uh, the deepness of that plane is about 80 centimeters. The wideness of that working plane will be about two meters. So depending on a kitchen, so it's very comfortable to, uh, to uh, cook there. And uh, this is the dishwashing area. And here you can see, first you pick up the dirty uh, dishes, then you pre-clean them. Then you put them into the dishwasher they are being washed. Afterwards, they are being hot steamed in order to get rid of any contamination that could be on the plates. So a steam, a hundred degrees of centigrade, that's a lot. Most of the germs will die in that uh, kind of steamer. And uh, the steaming takes an hour, maybe a half, hour, half an hour, but it takes enough long time to get rid of all the germs. Here you can put the clean plates and you can give them to the kitchen. This is the soup cooker. So you don't cook a soup for a restaurant in a typical pot. It's a huge pot that allows you to, uh, to cook uh, several, sometimes a hundred liters of soup at once. And um, this is this kind of electrical pot that you see here. And um, you probably wonder how to clean it. You clean that on spot. It's not the type of the pot that you can just take out and clean in the other place. You have to clean it on spot. I will show you how the kitchen looks like. There's a gutter around the kitchen. It has to be very, very clean. So it allows you to clean all the kitchen and everything to be uh, perfectly clean. This is the oven. Of course, it's a small oven. Uh, in the professional restaurant, these kind of ovens can be two meters high, two meters wide, and it allows you to cook um, 100 meals at once. This is the cooking core. Uh, so you can see different two types of cookers, the fryers, the deep fryers uh, to do the fries. And these are the uh, bemars that allow you to keep things uh, to, uh, sorry, these are the bemars that allows you to uh, keep things warm. These are the ones that you uh, put the food uh, inside and it keeps things warm with uh, hot water. And this is some sort of uh, pan, probably for doing the pancakes 
like this kind of plate that is very, very hot. And here you can see the work in the kitchen. This is the typical cooking core. These are the preparation areas around it. Here you can see a huge, a huge ventilation that allows to ventilate all this hotness and all these smells outside. So this is the ventilation core. It's nothing like a typical ventilation that we have in our houses. This is the distribution space. So here uh, the food that is prepared is being given and it can be taken by the waiter to the outside. The freezers and the refrigerators. And this um, photograph shows very well how many plates you need in the typical professional kitchen. See the amount of the equipment. So this kind of kitchens are very, very large. Another cooking core, the bread uh, pots here. And this is the um, kitchen area that was designed by Professor uh, Przemysław Nowakowski, one of the professors from our faculty in for the nursery in Długorwenka. This is the kitchen that has to follow a uh, very severe un European Union um, standardized um, regulations. Uh, so it is designed according to all of these control points. So at every control point, the quality of food and cleanness and uh, safety is controlled. Uh, so this is the main uh, cooking core with additional sinks. Uh, here are additional sinks for each working place, additional cupboards. As you can see, everything is made from stainless steel that allows everything to be cleaned perfectly. The refrigerators. Uh, this is the mixer that they are using. So as you can see, it's a huge professional, almost industry-like machine. And this is the gutter that I've mentioned. So if you clean anything that is standing, that is standing and you cannot move it like an oven, like this pot that I've shown you, everything is being directly cleaned to this gutter. And of course, it has to, all of this floor has to be also kept, per, kept perfectly clean. Here you can see the ventilation pipe. Just imagine uh, the sections, just for you to imagine the scale of all of these elements. So these are the HACCP standards uh, showing um, the control points uh, for, each, um, for each station and telling what kind of control has to be uh, done for every meal that is going outside of this kitchen. And the fryers, the deep fryers, the ovens, the cookers. This was the kitchen that was actually uh, pre-prepared uh, before we came uh, inside, so it was just to be opened. Uh, here we can see the hotel in Oleśniczka. This is the um, kitchen that I was designing in the existing building. It was a kind of like a palace, like a building. So it was very hard to design because every, every room was so weird. So we had to adjust that to the uh, contemporary standards. So I'm showing you that because that shows uh, that kind of work in practice. And I will tell you what could we connect together uh, just to make it more um, feasible, better. The, um, uh, so it was like a wedding palace. This was our, um, um, this was what we were supposed to do, a wedding palace. Uh, so uh, there was a huge room for a huge amount of tables, like uh, 150 people. And there was, uh, of course, the exit to the outside from the room for evacuation purposes, but also going to the garden. And there was uh, like a glass house there and there was um, some additional pergolas. So to make the wedding more romantic and of course, huge amount of toilets. As you all know, of course, the toilet adjusted for the needs of people with disabilities, uh, the stage for the band and some additional spaces for them. And this was the kitchen area and a bar. So the bar had back towards the kitchen areas in order to connect these two functions together and make it more economic.
that was the kitchen area so this is the kitchen as you can see it's not that huge it's not what 100 meter of uh, square meters of kitchen the smallest professional kitchen shouldn't be less than uh, 50 square meters and uh, here you can see the cooking core inside the ovens and the pots and all the preparation areas this was the preparation areas for the kitchen so as i've mentioned to you fish eggs and vegetables because we didn't have a lot of enough of space so the health department allowed us to connect these three rooms into one uh, except for eggs we couldn't get the eggs there so there is separate room and eggs are prepared here and then given through that preparation room. This is the garbage area. As you can see, no doors touching uh, towards the other spaces. And uh, we had the delivery area, uh, the area for uh, the area for the uh, for the kitchen staff. That was their social room. That was the toilets for them and the cloakroom. And uh, here we had different types of storages. So here, here, all of these places here are these storages, uh, different types of storages that I have aforementioned. This was the, dishing, uh, the dishwashing area and uh, this was the waiter's room and the connection to the, to the kitchen. And here you can see the back of the bar and uh, everywhere here we had some storage areas because there was so much need for having storage area and there wasn't enough space for storage area. This was the drink storage here for kitchen and for the bar area. So this is how it looks like in practice. It's in practice, it's usually very hard to design. I know that Agnieszka have mentioned to you the bathrooms, but I'm gonna show you the bathrooms that are freestanding because apart from public bathrooms in the buildings that Agnieszka shown you, there are also freestanding bathrooms. What is important when designing freestanding bathroom is that the freestanding bathroom has to have a hole. And um, so you cannot just go directly. So you have another room in front of the bathroom. Then you have the sink area and then you have the toilet area uh, designed according to what Agnieszka told you. Of course, the dimensions in the public uh, freestanding bathrooms are even bigger. Uh, so um, there is a need for additional space there uh, because people may have uh, suitcases, as Agnieszka told you last time, but also can have backpacks. Uh, they are outside, so they may have clothing, they may have coats. There have to be hangers for that and there have to be placed inside of the toilet, bathroom. Uh, so for these additional things. And of course, a toilet towards the people with disabilities. This is another example. There is a hole inside and there are access to the uh, women's bathroom, men's bathroom and bathroom for people with disabilities. Uh, there are also here additional spaces for storage from some sort of additional cleaning um, equipment because that's needed in every bathroom, but it's also needed, this, this is a pavilion for serving some additional functions. I would like to also turn your attention uh, a little bit more to the bathroom for people with disabilities. Agnieszka have already mentioned all of these important things to you, but what is also very important and what I have also glued for our Facebook page is that we need additional side space for person on the wheelchair. I know it's not in every bathroom for people with disabilities, but when the person with disabilities sits from her wheelchair and cannot use her legs, it's much easier to move towards the side, to slide towards the bathroom, than trying to sit on the toilet that is in front of you. So always remember about that comfort and it's not only about the regulation, but it's also about the comfort. Comfort. So I'm showing you these additional dimensions. I'm showing you that the mirror has to be inclined so it's easy to see when you sit. And also, as you have noticed, many of the uh, things for people with disabilities have this arc here that is convex towards the person. And this is because you can slide downwards to your 
uh, thing and using this arc here you don't trip a water over your pants or your skirt notice that whenever we are using the sink we are standing a little bit in distance not to drip our clothes the same is for people with disabilities it's much better to design this kind of sink because it helps all of that people to be clean when they are go outside of the bathroom not to be wet so just a few additional slides showing you these different additional grips and this is a very important slide because it shows you that the sidebar is always you can always raise it up slide towards the toilet and then lower it for your comfort you don't have to lower it if you don't need it but if you need it it's there for you and if you don't need it you can just raise it up so that's a very comfortable uh, solution and now just a few words about drawing the slope of the auditorium. This is the photograph from the blackboard that I've taken in the last semester, just for us to feel again like in the classroom. So uh, in order to design a proper graph for sight lines, uh, we need to know where the point that we want to observe is. And this point can be um, in the different places depending on what type of venue we are designing. So if we are designing a theater, we need to see the shoes of the actor. This is the stage. This is the distance between the stage and the rows. These are the rows. So the shoes of the actors we observe at the edge of the stage. So this is the point we have to see. So the slope, as you can see, will be much higher just imagine these people in observing that point for the concert hall we need to see the violin or the trumpet so basically what we need to see is we need to see above the knees of the um, of the musician so the point is about 40 centimeters above the stage above the floor of the stage and at least a meter from the edge of the stage it can be distance if the stage is large but it has to be a minimum a meter. And if we are designing a movie theater, we need to see uh, the edge of the screen, which is usually 10 to 8 meters from the viewers and at the distance of meter, meter 50, depending on what type of dimensions you have in the movie theater. If you want to design a conference building, then you need to know where's the podium and you need to see the face of the speaker, maybe the hands and not so much more of anything else okay so uh, the meter the stage so the first head of the viewer is a, a, around two meters from the verge of the stage and about 45 meters is the uh, is the first row so it's about meter uh, two meters and 45 centimeters from the beginning the row can uh, have from 35 centimeters 55 centimeters depending on what kind of comfortable seating you want to design and the uh, dimension of the space between the rows is from 90 centimeters to a meter 10 depending on how many people you want to have sitting on the stage uh, on the auditorium sorry so the head of the viewer is 1 meter 20 it's a standardized dimension, so it's not always true, but we have to think about some sort of standard. So a meter uh, 20 from the, uh, from the floor. So that's the head of the viewer. And the distance of the head, so the circle we are drawing from the eyes, is 12 centimeters. 12 centimeters, sometimes 15 if somebody has a lot of hairdo, but the standard is uh, 20 centime uh, to it, um, uh, 12 centimeters, 12 centimeters. I think I, has, I said 20, 12 centimeters. Uh, so we connect the point with this point that we have of the items of the viewer. And then the next row we usually draw uh, in distance of 15 centimeters. So we uh, override this 12 centimeters and this different hairdo. So we take 
a little bit this three centimeters of caution so it's 15 centimeters it's the next head next eyes we see if they see if they see if that ray doesn't cut through the circle of the head then everything is okay we can have 15 15 15 15 if the ray starts to starts to cut through the head then we raise it to the 30 centimeters why 30 centimeters because these are the two steps of 15 centimeters so it's very comfortable everybody have the steps of 15 centimeters nobody trips on our steps because it's natural 15 15 15 if again this happens 45 centimeters and so on and so on so we raise the slope this is the simplest way to do the graph. Of course, there are other ways. There are some sinusoidal graphs. This one is very comfortable for us. And this one is the one that I'm recommending to my students for design. And uh, if the, uh, the distance between the rows, so the height here, is more than 50 centimeters, then we need to have the balustrade. The balustrade has to be one meter and 10 centimeters height. If we don't want to have all that height in front of us because we don't see good well through the balustrade, we can mm, draw a balustrade like that. Then it has to have 70 centimeters here and 40 centimeters here. So it has to be meter 30 of the whole balustrade. It can be with a straight angle. So it can be bended over with a straight angle. How many seats we are allowed to have in the row? Uh, for typical uh, auditorium, we have to have a passage of at least meter 20 between the seats. And if the suite seats are by the wall, we can have eight seats. If the seats are have two passages of meter 20, we can have 16 seats. If it has the another wall, eight centimeters. And this is the situation where the passage between the seatings is 45 centimeters. So the row is usually about 90 centimeters. The passage between the fixed elements of the seatings like this is 45 centimeters. We can add additional one seat to every of that space if we add here one additional centimeters. So it's 36 centimeters if this passage here is 46 centimeters then we can have 17 uh, 17 seats in the row if you have 36 uh, passage centimeters here then you can have nine seats in the row and it can come up maximum to 40 seats with two passages or 20 seats by the wall if the distance between the rows is um I think 55 centimeters. So the rows will have meter 10 then. But remember, the more space between the sittings, of course, the evacuation is safer, but the uh, sight lines will get harder to draw. So it's always some sort of some sort of compromise. This is why in many concert halls you will see that seats are very narrow and they are opening like that in order to make the rows as close to the stage as possible, not to make them too high. Also, you can see that if uh, we will do the configuration that sittings in one row are going behind the sittings in one row in staggered uh, um, configurations. So when I view from my seat, I see the heads of my viewers on the sides of me, I'm looking uh, on the axis between their heads, then we can do the graph for every other seat. So for this seat and for this seat. This is the benefits of standard configurations. Thank you.